Good evening and welcome to worship for this special Ash Wednesday service. I'm Pastor Justin and this is Harsel United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the early church observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. It became the custom of the early church that before the Easter celebration, there would be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and separated themselves from the community of faith would be reconciled back by repentance and forgiveness and restored to full participation in the life of the church again. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and the forgiveness that's proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need that we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the church to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, by fasting and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our moral nature, let us begin this evening in a moment of silent prayer and confession before God. Let us pray. O God, maker and judge of us all, from the dust of the earth you formed us, and from the dust of death you will rise us up. By the redeeming power of the cross, create in us tonight a pure heart. Put a new spirit within us, that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Amen. Our reading for tonight comes from Psalm 51. Let us hear the words of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak, and justified when you judge. Surely, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise and your good pleasure make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, 
Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it was May of 1948. A 19-year-old Al Johnson had just joined two other men in robbing a Kansas City bank. They escaped with about $1,000, which at that time was quite a bit of money. And shortly after that, the two other men died in a car accident. They were quickly identified as the bank robbers, and so the case was closed. And Johnson thought that he was in the clear. Until about four years later. Four years later, he went out to his mailbox, and he, he had a Christian tract that was there in the mail. And it was entitled, God's Plan of Salvation. And something about it just made him want to really read what this book said. And so he opened it up, and he began to read. And one of the verses just jumped out the page to him. This is what it said, Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and, and that verse just jumped out at him. And for the very first time in his life, he realized that this gift, this gift of salvation and forgiveness was for him. That it didn't matter what his past was like. It didn't matter what he had done. It didn't matter where he had been. It didn't matter about the guilt and the shame that he felt from his past crime. That he could be forgiven. And so that day, as he sat there in his room, he decided to give his life to Jesus Christ. He accepted the gift of salvation, and his life immediately began to change. He, he stopped lying, he stopped cheating, and after a lot of prayer, he really felt like God was calling him to confess his crime. And so he went down to the police station, he admitted his crime to the authorities, he paid back the bank, all because his heart had been utterly broken by a God who loved him enough to die for his sins. Tonight is Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday marks the first day in the season of Lent. Lent symbolizes the 40 days that Jesus spent out in the wilderness being tempted by the desert, uh, by the devil. It's a season of preparation. It's a season of reflection, a season of confession and repentance as we come face to face with our stuff with our mess, with our sinfulness. And tonight as we center in, I'd like for us to look at this theme of brokenness. Brokenness. Because if we're truly to be used by God, we must be broken of our stuff. We must be broken of our sin. We must be broken of ourselves because unbroken people are like unbroken horses. They're not any good. Right? I mean, just think about a horse, a wild stallion that's being ridden for the very first time. The moment you try to put the saddle on it, the moment you try to put the, the harness on it, it immediately starts to buck and to fight you every single step of the way. It, it cannot be ridden right away. It has to be broken. And the same is the case with us. If the extent to which God can use us is dependent on the extent of our utter brokenness before God. The extent of our confession and our repentance because God uses broken things. I mean, just think about it. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. It takes broken clouds to bring forth the rain. It takes uh, broken bread and grain to bring forth the bread of the earth. It takes the broken body of Jesus Christ to bring the gift of salvation only broken things can fully be used by God. So look at what David says in our text for tonight. Notice what he says. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. What does God want? The sacrifices of God are this, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. What God wants what God desires from us, what God longs for, is brokenness. Brokenness. A broken spirit, a broken heart, a contrite heart, a broken people, people who pour out their lives before Him because when we do that, we can be used by Him. So what does it look like to be broken before God? I want to suggest three things for you tonight. 
And the first is this, that brokenness is a posture of confession and repentance before God. A posture of confession and repentance before God. I mean, just set, let me set the scene for you a little bit. Psalm 51 is one of the few psalms that actually gives us a concrete setting in life. We're actually told why this psalm was written. We're told in the superscript that this is a psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, this is the prayer that David prayed the moment that he was confronted by Nathan over his affair with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of Uriah the Hittite to cover it up. That David comes to acknowledge his sin, to confess his sin, to repent, to ask God for forgiveness. He comes openly, honestly, admitting where he is. He, he, he comes full of his fault and his sin and his guilt and his shame. And he pours out his heart before God. I mean, just notice the heavy concentration of I and my language. Have mercy on me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is before me. Against you I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I, 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 me, me, me. What's David doing? He's taking ownership. Right? He's taking personal responsibility for what he's done. Personal responsibility for his sin and his stuff. Of all the ways that he has violated the, the things of God. He even goes so far as to say, God, you are right and I am wrong. You are right and I am wrong. When you judge me, your judgment is justified. I deserve it. He's not trying to sugarcoat the problem. He's not trying to pass the buck to somebody else. He's taking responsibility for what he's done. He's confessing. He's repenting. He's broken before God. You see, ashes are a symbol of our confession. They're a symbol of our repentance from sin. When you see that person with the, the cross of Christ and the ashes on their forehead, it declares their confession and their repentance of sin before God. When the Ninevites heard the word of the Lord that was proclaimed to them through the prophet Jonah, immediately they declared a fast from the least of them to the greatest, even the animals. And everyone in the city put on sackcloth and ashes as a symbol of their confession and their repentance before God. When God confronts Job at the end of the book, Job says, look, I take everything that I said back. I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance before you. Jeremiah, he, he calls the people to repentance, saying, put on sackcloth, roll in ashes. And the early Christians would actually continue this practice. Tertullian says that the confession of sin should be accompanied with sackcloth and ashes. The church historian Eusebius recounts one story of a repentant believer who covered himself with sackcloth and ashes when he went to the Pope to ask him, to reinstate him for Holy Communion. It was a symbol of confession, a symbol of repentance. And that's what we see from David here as well. I love how he puts it in the parallel passage in 2 Samuel 12. As soon as Nathan gets there, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against God. He, he doesn't wait. He doesn't stall. He immediately cries out in repentance before God. He acknowledges what he has done. He doesn't excuse it or try to pass the buck or try to blame anyone else. He confesses openly before God. Joel puts it this way. Return to me with all of your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, right? Break your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious to you compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting of all evil. But it starts with confession, with repentance, with brokenness. You see, David calls us tonight to take this time and to sit in our stuff. 
to meditate, to dwell on it, to, to offer up the places to God that we've been, to offer up the things that we've done, to, to lay them all down at the feet of Jesus, to openly acknowledge what we've done. But I think a lot of times that's the problem because we have a hard time accepting blame for just about anything. Right? It's really easy to pass the buck to say, well, it was their fault. You know, just this weekend, uh, my mom was back in town, and that, I remember her talking about a time back when I was in, uh, getting, going up to, uh, to get some uh, extra education, and I went up, and I, there was ice on the road, and I slid into the back of somebody else, and, and I, I blamed mom because she didn't have gas in the car, that if I wouldn't have had to stop for gas, that would never have happened. Right? We, we have this tendency to, to pass the buck. Right? If there's problems in our marriage, it's our spouse's fault. If there's parent the problems in our lives, it's our boss's fault. It's the government's fault. It's our, our kids' fault. It's our we grew up wrong. You know, we, we're always finding somewhere else to pass the buck. You know, I think of the very first time that humanity sinned. Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve have just eaten the forbidden fruit. God approaches them to you know, get them to admit what they've done. And Adam's first reaction is to blame God and then to blame Eve. Look what he says. The woman you gave me, she gave me fruit, and I ate. And then God turns to Eve and asks what she's done. And immediately she points the finger at the serpent. The serpent tempted me. Right? They both point the finger at someone else because it's easier to blame someone else than it is to own our stuff. But David says, if we're really to be broken by God, we have to own our stuff. We have to own our sin. I mean, David could have said, well, it was Bathsheba's fault. She shouldn't have been out there on top of the roof bathing naked in the first place. But he doesn't. He admits what he's done. He pours out his heart before God in confession and repentance. And so I wonder, what sins do you need to openly confess to God tonight? Where do you need to repent? Where do you need to acknowledge what you've done? Acknowledge the places you've been that you might receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that God is offering to you tonight. Brokenness is a posture of confession and repentance before God. Secondly, we see that brokenness is a posture of utter desperation before God. Utter desperation before God. You know, David isn't just admitting his fault. He's not just talking about the things he has done. He's talking about his desperate need. I mean, just notice the language. It's not just forgiveness of his sins that he wants. He wants God to do something far more profound, far deeper within him. He wants him to cleanse his heart. Right? To create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Cleanse me from my sin. Wash away my iniquity. Over and over, he, he's not just asking God to, to take care of the sinful things he's done. He, he's not concerned with just his acts. He's concerned with something else, something deeper, something within him. He's, he's, he's dealing with his sin nature, that, that thing inside him, in his heart, that's the root cause of what he does. He doesn't want God just to deal with the surface level stuff. He doesn't want God to just put on a band-aid and forgive him and not really deal with what's really the problem in his life. He wants God to thoroughly wash him and cleanse him that he can be different than he was before. That his heart would be changed. I mean, just think about spring cleaning. You know, lit literally means spring and and. and uh, spring cleaning, when we, when we do spring cleaning, we take a lot of time and energy to really cleanse the house thoroughly in ways that we don't do at any other time of year, right? We wash down the walls, you know, we strip the floors, we clean the windows, wipe out the covers, clean out the, the freezer, the fridge, dry clean the drapes, steam the carpet, right? We get, wipe down all the cobwebs, move all the furniture, get all the gunk that's piled up beneath it and behind it. Right? We're, we go to so much trouble. And, and, and the thing I think that it, spring cleaning reminds us is even though it might look clean on the surface, 
that deep down beneath the surface there's a lot of dirt and grime that pile up and the same is the case in our own life that's what david wants us to see here you see the surface alone the things he did aren't the real problem what's what's the real problem is buried it's deep beneath the surface. It's a lot bigger of an issue. It was that lustful heart that led him to act out in those kinds of ways. The real problem is our sin nature. Our sin nature. It's that thing that gives birth to those actions. It's our sinful heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 puts it this way. The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. It's deceitful, it's wicked, it's, it, it's, it's corrupt. I mean, just think about snow for a minute, right? The Bible talks about snow a lot. We even hear it here that, wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. It talks about that snow as something that's pure, as something that's clean, as something that's righteous. Have you ever looked at a snowflake? I mean, they're, they're incredibly beautiful, right? They're, they're, they're intricate, they have different shapes and different sizes, uh, not... No two of them are alike. They're everyone different. But the one thing that every snowflake has in common is that they have a dirty heart. They have a dirty heart. I mean, every snowflake starts off as a tiny dust particle. A tiny dust particle. And just like snowflakes, we have been created beautiful. We're unique. We're different. We're special. But we all have dirty hearts. Dirty hearts that need to be cleansed by God. That we need God to come in and change something within us. That's what David wants us to hear. It's not just this isolated moment in his life where he messed up. But there is something deeper. Deeper. Far down beneath the surface. It's not just that little bit on the, above the surface of the iceberg that's the issue. It's all that stuff underneath that you can't see on the surface that is far more important. It's that thing in him that he says is fundamentally wrong. But he says that he's born with it. I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the moment my mother conceived me. Right? It's not just this one-time thing. Right? That, that, that it's been there since the moment he took his first breath. And because of that, surface level stuff isn't going to cut it. It's not going to be enough to just you know, stick on a band-aid and hope he gets better. If he wants to actually change and act different in the future, th then he's going to have to deal with something inside. And so what's he do? He, he wants God to, to deal with his attitude. He wants God to deal with his desires. He wants God to deal with his heart. And so he says, God, I want you to dig deep. I want you to dig deep, deep, deep down beneath the surface. I want you to take your scalpel and do some real deep surgical work within me. Create in me a clean heart. A clean heart. Not just a renewed heart, but an entirely different one. He, he wants God to do a heart transplant. A heart transplant in his life to change his nature and that's what brokenness is. Not just a heart that's fixed up a little bit. A broken heart. A heart that is utterly shattered and crushed and wrecked and destroyed. That, that, that you want something fundamentally different with your life. That God would take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That it would no longer be who you are and I don't know about you but that's been one of the deepest prayers in my life that I, I constantly am praying God change my desires change what I want to be what you want make me new and whole because all this stuff I, I'm tired of it I'm, I, I'm at the end of my rope I'm, I'm tired of going down the same path over and over and over and over again you see, ashes represent not only our repentance and our confession, but the deep-seated grief that cries out for something different. That cries out for a real and lasting change. 
when Tamar was raped, she immediately sprinkles ashes on her head, tears her robe, and with her hands buried in her face, cries out to God in utter desperation. When Job's friends come to comfort him, they begin to weep aloud. They tear their robes, they sprinkle dust on their hands, and they cry out in desperation for what they see. When Daniel learns of the destruction of the capital city of Jerusalem, he immediately turns to God and he pleads with him in fasting and sackcloth and ashes. When Mordecai hears that the Jews are going to be annihilated, he immediately cries out in weeping and bitterness and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And when David learns of his sin, he cries out for a new heart. God would rip him apart, rip out his heart of stone, and give him a heart of flesh. I wonder when was the last time that you cried out with that sense of desperation for your stuff? Not just for the things that you've done, but for what's behind them. For that sin nature, that, that wicked, evil desire to be ripped out of your heart. I wonder, do you really want to be broken? Or do you just want God to give you a little fixer-upper? You just want him to slap a band-aid on and act like everything's okay. That brokenness is a posture of utter desperation for real change. And then finally, we see that brokenness is a posture of total surrender before God. Total surrender. I mean, in many ways, this prayer isn't just a request of God. Right? It's a it's a posture of surrender. When he says, give me a new heart, what he's effectively saying is, I'm submitting my life to your work. I'm submitting my life to do whatever it is you call me to do. And he expects that God's going to answer him, right? He, he He's effectively saying, here I am, God. Use me. Use me. Make me new. Make me right. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you my will. I give you all that I am. Shape me because you are the potter and I'm the clay. Mold me into who you want me to be. Not my will, but yours be done. You see, brokenness is the way of surrender. Because if God is going to actually change our heart, there are some things that we have to let go of first. There's some things that we're going to have to be broken within us. We're going to have to be broken of our pride. We're going to have to be broken of our self-will. We're going to have to be broken of our stubbornness. We're going to have to be broken of our lustfulness, of our sinfulness, of our evil attitudes, our ungodly desires, our unforgiveness, our grudges. There's going to be some things that have to die in us, that we're going to have to be emptied out before we can be filled back up. Because if you have a, a, a pot of dirty water and you just pour clean water on top of it, the water still ends up dirty. Right? You have to empty out the filth, clean it out, and then put in that which is new. I mean, I think of the prostitute that comes to Jesus. She breaks that jar of perfume over his feet. And, and that jar probably was like a year's worth of wages. But even more than that, it was what that jar symbolized. Right? That jar was the symbol of her profession. It was the symbol of her job. When, when she went out to get new clients, she would put that perfume on to draw people in. To, to, most people did not have that kind of stuff because it was far, far too expensive. And so when, when she shatters that jar, what she's effectively saying is, I'm walking away from this way of life. Right? There's no going back. Right? You can't put the pieces of a broken jar together. There's no going back. I surrender everything I am to your will. That's what David is doing here. I think of Jesus the night that he was betrayed. He's sitting there in the garden of Gethsemane, faced with the cup, that, which in Gethsemane literally means the place of brokenness, the place of crushing. And he submits himself to God's will, not my will, but thine be done. 
You see, ashes are a symbol of our surrender. Our surrender. They represent death and mortality. So it's about a death to ourselves. A death to our stuff. I mean, just think about cremation, right? Ashes, mortality, they go hand in hand. In Genesis, God says, I made you out of dust, and to dust you'll return. It's a symbol of our mortality. And, and so the question is, will you die to yourself tonight? Right? Will you surrender to your stuff? Will, that God might fill you back up with who He is. Jesus said this, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. But we must die if we want to be resurrected to new life. And so I wonder, what do you need to die to tonight? What is it you're holding on to? What is it you're clinging to? What, where is it you're holding back? Because we all have a choice to either let go and fully surrender our lives to God or to hold on. And the extent to which we can be used by God is the extent to which we're broken of ourselves and we let go and allow God to fill us back up. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess tonight that we have sinned against you. We've sinned against you by our thoughts, our words, our deeds, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry, Lord Jesus, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins. Give us a new heart. Cleanse us thoroughly. Do that deep, deep surgical work within us to make us someone that we aren't right now. Give us the strength to die to ourselves. That we may delight in your will. Walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. So now may the grace of God, which has promised to forgive all of your sins, cleanse you and wash you as white as snow. See you on Sunday. God bless.